Hi, everyone, and welcome to the End of Life Journey and Beyond, The Sands of Time. My name is Lisa Strauss Lawrence, and I am a bereavement specialist. Hello, Susan. Always good to see you. Hello, Lisa. Welcome. Great to see you, too. My name is Susan Caperso. I'm an End of Life doula and legacy specialist. And we're very excited for our guest today, Lisa. We are. So this is Ada Haslacher who I met many years ago at a women's networking organization. And you never know where you're going to meet again. Always look at networking as a great source of communication and way to uh, see people. So today we're talking about divorce and grieving. So Ada is the founder of the Divorce and Mediation Center. She's also a trainer uh, for the Center for Mediation and Training, New York City. She's been a mediator for over 21 years. She co co co-host a monthly peer group for mediators and she also served on the board of directors for the council for divorce and mediation so we welcome you and Thank this you. is a really important topic so many people have said to me why don't you do something about divorce because it really is grief so today we're going to talk about that important topic so ada tell us a little bit also how you got involved with this and um you know and your years of experience in Okay. In a nutshell, because it's a very long story. Um, I had been a commercial real estate broker for close to 20 years and just hit the wall, just didn't want to do it anymore. Um, Soup dog eat dog for me. And I wanted to use my negotiating skills in an arena that really would make a difference in people's lives. And I was reading an article in the Long Island Business News where they would profile a different industry every week. And one week they were profiling matrimonial attorneys um, and the word mediation kept popping up. And I was curious about whether you needed to be a lawyer to be a mediator. Well, lo and behold, I found out, no, you do not need to be an attorney to be a mediator and that there was training. And I trained at the Center for Mediation and Training in the city uh, in 2003. And I remember walking out of the break on the first day and I called my husband and I said, I have found my life's work. I have found what I was meant to do. I felt that everything in my life not just the real estate, but things that I had done previously had kind of brought me to this moment to do this. And I never looked back. And I got involved in all the mediation communities right away, continuing education because there's so much to the work that we do. In fact, we have a 40 hour basic training coming up on Friday. Um, and there's just so much that you can cover in 40 hours. Um, but it really piqued my interest in an incredible way. And I just stepped into that world. And as I said, I never look back. Um, what I love about the work that I do is just from an instinctual standpoint, I have a feeling to be able to help people in that way. I know that what we do is keep them out of the court system because it's very adversarial. It's frankly disgusting what happens. People do not get justice served in the court system, despite what they may think, because we're really dealing with a lot of emotional issues. We're dealing with families. We're dealing with children. We're dealing with their financial future and how they're going to preserve the family structure and be able to move on in a different way but still be okay financially, emotionally, spiritually, and every other way that we can possibly do it. And that is my commitment to my clients, to help them do this as amicably as they can and in the best interest of their children going forward. And I don't care how old your kids are, even children who are in their 20s are impacted by what's going on with their parents. They don't wanna to have to choose sides. They don't wanna to have to worry about where they're going for Thanksgiving and the rest of the holidays. And they certainly don't want to be therapists for their parents. So the way parents do this in a dignified and civil way is really what I focus on with them to keep the kids out of it. And especially with young children, I, you know, I remind my clients, you don't want to make your children the messenger, the monkey in the middle and the secret keeper. And, you know, it's hard enough to be a kid these days. All right. Much different than when we were growing up. It's a, a whole different world now. And whatever they as parents can do to help them 
grow up healthy and whole without having to worry about what's going on to the degree that we can do something like that is really the focus of my mediation. I always tell my clients that children are the unwitting participants in the mediation. So I will be their voice for them. So when the parents are going a little crazy, I just bring them back. How is this going to impact the kids? They think the kids aren't listening or they don't know what's going on. Not true. They know, they intuit it. And, you know, if you don't want them to end up on the psychiatrist couch, right? The way they do their separation, right? It's so beautifully said and you sound amazing at what you do. And this is the reason, um, you know, Lisa and I have talked about this topic for a long time now. You know, although we focus and concentrate on grief, we all know that there are so many other aspects of grieving besides losing your loved one. That's and right. that's why it, it's important for us because I would say almost the number two would be through divorce, through breaking up a family. And everybody grieves that. And I don't care who you who you are, what you say. Um, this happened to me when I personally, when I was 12 years old. And guess what? Won't tell you my how old I am now, but it's it still affects me today because my family was broken into pieces. So what you do is very commendable and thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. You know, I had participated in a, um, a workshop, a seminar a number of years ago where they had adult children talking about the impact that their parents' divorce had on them. And, you know, some of these stories were heartbreaking. I mean, they really, really were. Some of them delayed in getting involved in intimate relationships because they didn't want the same thing to happen to them that they watched happen to their parents. One woman who was in her 30s at this point would told the story about how her parents had gone through such a vitriolic divorce when she was about 17, 18, and she had a younger sister, that this woman delayed going away to college to be able to stay home and protect her sister while her parents were going through this divorce. So, yes, I mean, I, you know, after 21 plus years, I've, I've heard every story you can imagine. And it just resolves me even more to do good focused work with people and remind them because I know when they come to me, they're just looking at, you know, the immediate shock of what's happening, the worry about their future. How are they going to do this? Do they have to sell the house? What happens with the kids? They're just overwhelmed with so many decisions that they have to make. And then I also, you know, tell them when we go through the mediation, you know, stop listening to the Greek chorus of well-meaning friends and family who are going to give them advice. You know what you should do. You know what I did. Don't do this. Don't do that. It can make them crazy sometimes listening to all this. It's well-meaning. Believe me, it is. I know that they're trying to protect them, but every case is different. And their situation is not exactly what your situation is right now. And the other thing that happens also when you not when the Greek chorus is whispering in your ear, after a while, if you don't take their advice, they get upset and annoyed and they don't want to hear it anymore. And sometimes you can lose friendships over, over it. So I always suggest to them that if you need to vent to somebody, work with a professional, meet with a therapist, just get it out there and stop telling everybody all the dirty details of what's going on for you. It's hard to hold it back, but it's important not to, not to involve so many people in what's going on. Very important. And another thing is just to confirm what you do, you people must confirm what you do all the time because they must meet you now at this point and say, Oh my gosh, I wish I would have had you back then. Yep. You hear that often, right? Yep. Yep. And I've had clients come to me after they've tried, you know, to lawyer up and litigate. Mm -hmm. um, some of them will come to me and say, you know, this is not who we are. We don't hate each other. You know, he's a good dad. I, I am not taking these kids away from him. We've got to work this out together. And that is not what was happening with our attorneys. 
So that's one thing. The other thing is it's very costly to litigate, not only in money, but in time. I can do a mediation on average, it could take six months or so, maybe a little bit longer sometimes, but a litigated divorce can take years. So, you know, you're living in this horrible limbo while you're going through this whole process. And in addition to keep putting the zeros at the end of that retainer check, you know, that's the other part of it, right? Some of them, money's tight to begin with while they're living together when you're separating households now. You're, you're living on a lot less money because you're doubling down on rent or mortgage and utilities and, and all of that. So, you know, I know that people come to mediation not only because they want to do things amicably, but they want to save money. And I'm here to help them do both of those things. Sure, sure. Yep. Interesting, because um, my first um, my first connection with divorce was my cousins. My uncle and aunt screamed at each other all the time. I mean, whenever you go to the house, that's all you'd hear. But their rationale was we're going to wait until the kids grow up. Right. And, right. In those days, that's what they used to do. Right? right. They thought that they were doing that to the benefit of children. Meantime, my two cousins divorced as well, which I'm sure you see very you know, often um, mm -hmm. because they haven't laid the groundwork for what a good relationship is. And so they don't really know. And all they've lived with is just that anger. So, um, let's and, that, talk and there's a lot of truth to that, Lisa, because, you know, the idea that we're going, we want to, we don't want to get, we don't want to separate until the kids are out of the house. First of all, what does that mean when they go to college or you wait until they graduate from college? That's a long time. If the marriage is not working, it's not going to be good for the kids. They're better off living in two separate, you know, going back and forth to two happy households and to be living in a miserable household. So even though the intention is there to do right, sometimes it's not good to stay together. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so the feelings, the emotions that deal with the fact that you thought you had something and right. now you have nothing um, and it's falling apart. Right. You see that all the time. And that's yeah. a whole process of grieving what you what you wanted, what you thought you had. That's so right. Talk about that with us. Hello. Yeah, I mean, I see clients all different. Some have been married a year or two, which mm -hmm. you know is amazing to me. You know, they're so busy with the wedding and the planning and all of that that they forgot <laughs> that there's a relationship that has to be worked on on the other side of the party. <laughs> um, and then I'm doing a lot of gray divorces now. Wow. Um, and those are 35 plus year marriages where they want different things in their golden years. Now they can't seem to kind of get on the same page to maybe live parallel lives together, but they, you know, maybe she wants to spend a lot of time with her daughter and the grandchildren in Minnesota. And he just wants to go fishing upstate and they just can't seem to find a way to stay together. Um, and it would just be healthier for them to separate. So even though they're both on the same page that this is the right step for them, there's still the death of a marriage. There's still a loss here, you know, and I think about this all the time because when we have when we experience somebody's mortal death, we have a lot of ritual around it. There's the funeral, there's the wake, there's the shiva, there's there's all of that kind of coming together of family and friends to support and be there for the person who has lost a person in their life. But we don't afford the same thing for people who are going through a divorce. And even though sometimes somebody will say, you know, yippee, it's over. And I do have people who feel that way and they will have divorce parties. Yes. <laughs> you don't really see it that much, you know? So I wonder sometimes, you know, when, when we finally get the final judgment of divorce that comes, you know, by email now, and, you know, we send it to the clients and let them know the judgment has been signed. And I always say, you know, I wish you both the very best going forward. My door is always open. Should you need me for anything, please, you know, feel free to call me or email me. But I don't know what happens on the other side. Like, what are they doing to put closure to the whole thing for themselves? Just like when you grieve somebody that you've lost. And I've just recently paid a shiva call to a very dear friend of mine who lost his brother. Um, 
it takes time. There's no timetable on grief. You know, sometimes people bury themselves with work and they get busy and they don't want to think about it, but then something will happen and it'll all just kind of the floodgates open at that point. You know, I used to think it was, bar. you know, when I was young, I used to think it was just barbaric, you know, to have, you know, funerals and, you know, all of this stuff. And as I've gotten older, I've come to appreciate how important, you know, that first year you miss the birthdays, the anniversaries, the holidays, that first year without that person really means something to you. And well, I wonder, you know, what happens in a divorce. Yeah, I have to interrupt you. Mm. It's opportunity. Here is an opportunity, and you're talking about it right now. What do they say to inventors? They say, find an opportunity, find a need, find something that people need and create it. Well, here's your opportunity. There needs to be some type of a closing ceremony. And I'm not talking about a divorce party. Right. Where we get together and open six bottles of wine. Right. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about some other type of closing ceremony. And it can be with the girlfriends. It can be with the guy friends. Right. Well, but some type of ceremony that maybe you can offer to your clients. I don't know. That's not in our realm, but like you're saying, that's something that I think is really, really needed. I was and thinking, I've been thinking about it. My sister who lives in Seattle, she's a ritualist mm -hmm. and, you know, she does weddings and she does funerals and baby blessings and housewarmings. And she's done divorce rituals for people who really want to, you know, it, because the marriage means something and the divorce means something. And there needs to be, I believe, some really like a, a, a spiritual closure to all of that as well. And I talked to her about it. I mean, she could do it on Zoom, um, but I, I really I've, I've been thinking about what could be done because it really should be something in person. You know, where you're gathering with the people who are important to you to help you, um, you know, just acknowledge that this is a big event in your life. I have a lot of great ideas about that, Ada. We can talk off camera at one okay. day if you'd like to. I'd love but to. I have ideas on how to bring this um, to fruition locally, because I do agree as well, in person with this type of thing would be more important because there are little little things that you could do in the ceremony right. um, that will help everybody, the family, the extended family, and yep. to be yeah. a little bit of closure. Yep. You know, I was going to say that, you know, obviously with all of our funerals and everything, you know, it's family stuff, but in, in the divorce thing, the children, the immediate family are so affected by the whole thing that something needs to needs to be acknowledged, needs to be put together, not just dismissed. Okay. So now you go over here and you go over there. You know, okay. I, it's so disruptive for kids of all ages as they're growing up, even look, I mean, Susan even talked about it to this day. So I've not been affected by divorce, but I've seen others who have been yeah. friends. Um, and it, it's, and they still talk about it and they still right. talk about those sad feelings about it. Yeah, you know, people's right. sadness that didn't work, right. that it was something that they thought would work, that, it, you know, they had all their, their dreams, yes. you know, and it's not anymore. I mean, I tell them, you know, when they when I do a consultation with a client, I say, listen, the last place in the world you expected to be was with me now doing this work. I know, I know that. You know, once upon a time, they were standing in front of the minister, the priest, the rabbi, whatever was going on, professing undying love and a future together. And this is not what they ex where they ever expected to be. I, I, I really get that. Um, and sometimes people, you know, do need to move on. Sometimes things, you know, are good until they're not good. And I do encourage people to, you know, work with a couple counselor and really make sure that, you know, this is really what they want. Um, sometimes they come together and they both, yep, this is what we've talked about it. And we both agree we want to be friends. We want to be good parents to our children. Uh, but we know that, you know, marriage is not the best relationship for us. The friendship is going to be better. That was certainly the case with my first uh, marriage. Um, we wanted to be friends with each other, and we were. We were able to do it because 
I really believe intention is everything. When you intend for something to happen, you find a way to make it happen. Um, some people just really need to like never see each other again. You know, it's, it's not healthy. They really, and when, and I tell my clients also that when you have kids, you're not going to have that luxury. You don't get to like walk away and that's it. Yeah. You're always going to be parents to your kids. They're going to graduate from college. You're going to walk them down the aisle. You're going to be grandparents together. What do you want that to look like when you see your former spouse at these events? Do you want to be aggravated? Do you want to be annoyed? Do you want to dread going to these wonderful family events because you're going to see this person there? Or can you find a way, right, to just detach yourself from all of that stuff that you worked out in the mediation and now just be able to move forward and 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 be okay you know be okay with each other be happy when each of you have found somebody else who can make them happy right and, and you happy who suffer, who suffer from that still now today and can't go to that next wedding or event mm -hmm. and are sick about it and that doesn't have to happen so I want to be a little bit clear, Ada, on your services, because you did mention the word a few minutes ago, um, couples counseling is good for you. How does that differ from you? And okay. how much time do you spend with a couple before the divorce? And does it always end up in divorce? Okay, great question, Susan. So here we go. Therapy and mediation are two different things. Therapists work with couples, hopefully, to help them figure out a way to stay together, if, if that's possible. And if not, they can help clear the way to make the mediation go a lot smoother when they're not still dealing with you could have, you should have, you didn't do this, and why not, and all of that. So um, the therapist can help them discern, and I can do a discernment consultation with them too to decide you know if they're both in agreement about why they're here in mediation and what should happen to their marriage going forward a lot of times they're both on the same page that the marriage is over and they want to move forward in a separation and ultimate divorce sometimes one spouse wants out and the other one doesn't so now we have to get the one who doesn't kind of on board to realize that if and i always say this if one of if one spouse is out, the marriage is over. You can't be in a marriage by yourself. So now the question is, how do you get the one who's reluctant and upset about it to kind of, you know, get to the place where they realize that this is ultimately what's going to be happening and get them focused. What I do in mediation is I help them ultimately sign a contract, which is what we call the settlement agreement that spells out the following parent co-parenting, support for their children, what they're going to do, how they're going to make decisions when they're no longer living under the same roof together. You know, couples, you know, while they're getting dinner together and they're setting the table, oh, you know, Jack's got soccer practice tomorrow at four o'clock and you pick him up. That kind of thing is no longer going to be happening when they're living separately and apart. So now, they have to communicate even more clearly with each other, right? When they're not living under the same roof because they have to be on the same page with what's happening with the kids. So we're talking about child support. We're talking about all the extra support that is goes above and beyond what child support covers, extracurricular activities, medical expenses, all the technology, the cell phone, the laptop, the computers, the iPads, and the, all of the contracts that go along with it. How are all of those things going to be paid? How are they going to make a decision about college? How are they going to be paying for college? So a lot of issues around the children have to get worked out together in a mediated setting in order to know what we're writing into their agreement that they will ultimately be signing. And then there's what New York State calls equitable distribution of assets and debts. In a nutshell, everything that accrues during the marriage is considered marital property. There are a few minor exceptions to that rule, but bank accounts, retirement accounts, investment accounts, we all have to uh, accommodate for all of that and figure out how they're going to be dividing things in what they consider is a fair and equitable way. So that's what we're working on in the mediation. 
On average, when I'm working with couples with children, a marital home that has to be decided on, right? Because are they selling the house? Is one of them going to live in the house? And if so, how long? And then is it going to be sold at some point? And what point is that? Or is it going to be a buyout where the one staying in the house wants to buy out the other one's equity stake in it? And what is that going to look like? That all has to get worked out in the mediation. And then if they're dividing retirement plans. So I would say on average, it takes when I'm working with couples with those main issues there, somewhere between five to seven sessions to complete a mediation. How often we meet is up to them. Sometimes they are in a rush and they want to get things done. Boom, boom, boom. So we're meeting every week, every other week. And then there are times where they're not rushing. They need to take their time. They need to think things through. They may need to consult with their tax accountant, um, their financial advisor to get some advice from them. Then we incorporate all of that to make sure that they both, you know, I, I say that my job my main role as a mediator is not just to facilitate the voluntary agreements that they're making with each other, but I want to make sure they're making informed decisions. You know, as mediator, I don't have a judgment about the decisions they're making. What I care about is that they know what they're doing, they know why they're doing it, and they have all the information that they need in order to make a good decision for themselves. So ultimately, I write up a memorandum of understanding, then I hand it off to my drafting attorney who drafts the legal document, which is the settlement agreement. And then once they sign and notarize that, that becomes their legal binding contract. Now, some couples will live under that agreement for a while, and there are a couple of financial reasons that couples will do that. And sometimes they just say, we're ready to do the divorce package, and then we prepare that submit that to the court, and then they get the final JOD, the judgment of divorce. The only thing pretty much that they can't do while they're living under the settlement agreement and until the judge signs off on the divorce decree, they can't marry somebody else. They have to have a judgment of divorce in order to remarry. And I'll tell you, they always say to me at the end, because I have a reconciliation provision in the agreement that says once they sign and notarize the agreement, if they do decide that they don't want to file for the divorce and they want to reconcile, they have to rescind this agreement because it's a contract. They can't pretend that they didn't sign it. And when I bring up reconciliation, they say, oh, we're not reconciling and we're never getting married again. And I say, listen, I, you, I know you think you're never going to get married again, and that may be true. Probably it won't be true. You probably will get married again. But here's my advice. Second marriage especially, I have two words for you. Prenup. <laughs> Do a prenup because chances are you're going to be marrying somebody who is also divorced with children, and you want to make sure that you protect what you want to go to your children and he or she protects what they want to go to their children. And it's probably the most romantic thing that you can do in a second marriage is do a prenup. Uh -huh. So they always laugh about that, but I say, promise me, you'll come back to me and we'll do a prenup. Right. <laughs> and excuse me, I'm just plugging my charger in. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So the grieving part affecting the entire family and also affecting parents who, you know, were very attached to maybe that in-law, that son-in-law, daughter-in-law. I mean, it it is a whole family-wide thing. Right? It's true. It's true. You know, I have a friend who got divorced many years ago, back in the 80s, and her husband was very, very close with her nieces and nephew. I mean, they just loved him and he loved them. And when they got a divorce, he broke off all ties with the family and she said, you can't do that. The kids love you and I am okay with you. And he like, nope. So mm. the parents had to really sit down with them and explain as best as they could to these children why they weren't seeing him anymore. It was so sad. I felt I wasn't a mediator at the time. Now I would have offered my services to help the parents, you know, figure out a way to talk to these kids and explain that was very, very hard on them. So you're right, Lisa, it's not just affecting the immediate family, but the extended family also. That is so true. And that has to that has to be huge in your world because it, it's really huge in our world too, in, in end of life. So my husband was the, and I'm thinking of this because of what you just said, you know, the bright light, the loud person in the family loved by everybody. And when he died at 52, this was 10 years ago, 
And his side of the family kind of drifted. They say that with loss, you know, family dynamics change, things change. I could never understand because I was a big part of the loud celebrations too. Right. But um, Jim wasn't there anymore. And Uncle Jim was that side of the family. Right. So things changed. And you know what? My boys, they're older now, 26 and 31 or something like that. But it affected them. Yeah. Badly. Yeah. As much as their dad's loss, it affected them that how come we're not, how come the big family gatherings on right. here anymore? Why are we going out there like we did all the time? Right. But the family dynamics changed. So they weren't only grieving the loss of their dad, but they're grieving the loss of the whole extended family that yeah. where the dynamics changed. So that's how I can easily see that happening in the world of divorce. Absolutely. It's true. And you know, it's the quiet ones that you got to really watch. The one, you know, the ones who cry and say, why are we not, you know, they're vocal and they're expressing their sorrow and their grief about what's happened. But the ones who are quiet, who just kind of don't want to talk about it or shrug it off, it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. It is a big deal. And, you know, we need to pay attention to that and make sure that those children have an outlet to be able to express what's going on because they internalize it, which we know could be, you know, when I always tell people, get out of your head, it's dangerous in there, right? <laughs> you go round and around in that monkey mind and you, there's no resolution there. There's no closure. There's no clarity very often. You just make a decision about things as in, I'm always going to do blah, 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 or I'm never going to do blah, blah, blah. And life is just not black and white that way. Right. I so it's going to be OK. But I guarantee you, if you're listening to this today, they're not in some way, shape or form. That divorce usually will affect their own relationship in some way. It's in true. some way, as an adult woman in her 30s, thinking yeah. about how dad laughed or mom yeah. left. But forget about it. That stays with you until you're 60. It's true. It is so true. It is it really, it is true. That's why I keep reminding my clients as we go, you know, many, many years ago, um, I had a couple, they were just, this is when I was, I, cause I see people on zoom mostly now, and I was seeing them in my office and, you know, the, at one point the wife just lost it and she was just screaming at the husband and she needed to vent. And I, I let her go, you know, for a while. And he was just sitting there and he was listening and he was taking it. Um, cause I'm watching to make sure that he was okay with it. And she let it all out. And finally she kind of wound herself down and she leaned over the table and she said, you know, Ada, I'm not like this in my real life. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I said, I know that I know there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of worry. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of concern here. And there's a lot of, you know, we could have, we should have, we didn't blah, 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 but we can't go back. We can't take a ticket back to yesterday. This is where you are right now. And my question is, what do you want this to look like going into the future now? How can you do this better with each other? And I think that it is possible to do it better. Um, and the kids really, they're, they're watching and intuiting all of this stuff. So, you know, it's important for them to, they need to vent sometimes, but they, I know they want to do things well. They want to, be dignified when they're doing it, you know, because we don't like when, you know, when we get crazy with something and we just, we beat ourselves up after I shouldn't have acted that way or why did I? So, you know, just keeping them like on track and really helping them focus on what's really important um, going forward. And I know the kids are really important to them. They don't want them to suffer. So do any of your sessions, uh, maybe one session or, or anything, uh, include the children or bring the children in for you to rarely, speak? rarely, rarely. I mean, occasionally um, I have colleagues, uh, actually my mentor um, who was a child psychologist um, and he's still mediating, you know, in the city. Um, and he will recommend, he will say to them, let me, let me talk to your kids. Let, let, let me have a separate session with them because sometimes the kids will tell the mediator things that they won't tell the parents because they don't want to disappoint. Dad, I don't want to go to your house for Christmas this year. I want to go with mom. They're afraid to say that to dad. 
Um, so um, I, I've offered it, but nobody's actually ever taken me up on, you know, having the kids meet with me. Um, but I'm certainly open to doing it if they feel that it's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems yeah. to me that that would be a good idea. Yeah. 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 Especially with family. Teenagers. Yeah. Even just a family thing together. Just to hear each other and cry that it wasn't what we thought it was going to be or thought you two loved each other and now you're leaving and you know yeah. discussions that don't happen at home around the kitchen table that's right that's right, right. but you need an objective right. person anyway somebody like yeah. you to be able to say and and help that conversation it's such a different I mean the one conversation that I do help couples with is like they want to know like when should we tell the kids that this is happening especially young kids you know, when should we sit down with them? Should we do it now? Should we wait till we've worked things out in mediation? You know, when would be a good time? And I usually recommend work out the parenting plan so you know what the plan is going to be so you can let them know um, if, if that's at all possible. If it's really getting tense and you need to let them know why, you know, mom or dad is moving out of the house, you need to move that conversation up with them. Um, I, you know, also, you know, recommend that they sit down together and tell the kids, um, let them know that they can ask them anything and they may not have an answer for everything. And that's OK, too. And it's OK to cry. You know, it's a sad thing and it's OK for them to see that you're upset about it, that this is adults cry, too. And we're going to do the best we can um, because we love you and we want what's best for you. Um, but, you know, what's happening between the two of us has nothing to do with you. It's not because you didn't do your homework or you fought with your brother or you didn't empty the dishwasher because kids really, they think it's their fault if they had only done this out of the other. So they have to let the kids off the hook on that too and let them know this has absolutely nothing to do with you. You did nothing wrong and you did nothing that's going to fix this either. That's the other part of it. Not just that you didn't create the problem, but there's nothing that you can do to fix it. We are working out together how we're going to do this. So, yeah. And I have like a sheet, you know, that I give them on, you know, how to have the conversation with the kids if they need help with that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really, you do such important work and thank you for this because you know, and even though you may not solve the whole grief and and divorce issue after, you're doing so many powerful things to help maybe eliminate that beforehand, you know, with that pre-planning effort. So, I mean, I think that's a really big step that couples need to take. And, yes. you know, Susan, I, I, this is why I became a mediator, because I know that if they litigate, the boxing gloves are on. Yep. They're going to beat each other to a pulp. How I how are they going to communicate and co-parent if they do that? And I know they don't feel good about themselves when they're acting that way. Mediation gives them a platform and an arena and a forum to be able to do it better. It gets tense sometimes. There's no question about that. But ultimately, for the most part, they walk out of there and, you know, they thank me. They never thought this was possible. They did it better than their sister-in-law and their brother, you know, and I'm so happy to know that. And I tell them, you're the one who did the hard work here, you know, and thank you for allowing me to help you get to that place that ultimately I know in your heart you wanted to get to. You know, so it's kind of I call it an all get all around like we we all, you know, it's like a big group hug. We feel really good about the work that we did together. Yeah. Right. It's good right. work. Yeah, you're amazing. Yeah. So so one of the things, by the way, with mediation, people say, well, if it's too complicated and there's too much going on or whatever. And I said to people, mediation can be for anybody. It can be property and everything. It's the fact that you're coming together to yep. try and and put this in an amicable way that's correct I explain to them yeah um, yeah yeah i've i've worked with high net worth and high conflict couples sometimes they're both high net worth and high conflict uh, what I can do very often, and I do do this, is I bring in several other professionals, particularly around the financial stuff, whether it's a forensic accountant 
or CDFA, which is a certified divorce financial analyst to help them sort out the finances to get them where they both agree that they want to go. Because not all assets are created equal. Some have tax consequences now, some later. And I want to make sure that whatever they're deciding to do, as I said before, making informed decisions, I want them to work with somebody who's going to really help them understand. Here's the other thing. And this is so true in most relationships. Everybody goes to their strengths. So in, let's say the wife is the one who's handling the finances for the family. You know, maybe she's a CEO or CFO at a company where she works and she's managing the, and the husband never looks at the checkbook. The bills get paid, the money goes in, she's taking, and he has no clue at all how to look at this and how to make a good decision for himself. That's what, and she'll, and he'll, and the wife will say to him, I've already explained this to you. And I say, Jackie, he can't hear it from you. Okay. You've explained it how many times and he still doesn't get it. It's not because he can't get it. It's just some reason that he can't hear it from you. So let me bring in a CDFA to lay it all out. And then she or he could sit with him and explain everything because it's in both of your best interest that you both know what's going on so that you could both make a good decision. Because if one person is feeling like, I don't know, I'm afraid to sign this agreement because I don't, I don't know, then this, the agreement is never going to get signed. And the truth is that lawyers bring in forensic accountants and CDFAs also very often because they're not necessarily savvy about tax consequences with everything either. So what, what lawyers do in a litigated, we could do it in a mediation, but again, a lot less expensively, a lot less contentiously, and it's a much more streamlined approach. Yeah, I love it. Uh, do you work for one particular attorney on Long Island, or are you completely in your own practice doing this? I, I have my own practice, but I bring in resources as needed. So, you know, I've got my go-to, I have a forensic account I've been working with for a while. I have a CDFA I've been working with for a while. And there are others that, you know, I'll bring in as well. Um, Lisa and I were talking about it before the call. You know, you develop, you know, people that you know, people you like, people you trust, who you know are going to help your they're going to work with your client in the way that you do with the same spirit, with the same compassion, with the same empathy and with the same patience. Hmm. That's really the key, because what happens is and you think about this, somebody doesn't know, like in this case, the husband doesn't know the finances. And there's a lot of shame around that. I should know it. She explained okay. it. What's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. It's just it wasn't your bailiwick. That's OK. We're going to get somebody who's going to explain it to you so that you'll know, because not only do you need to know now in order to figure out what you're doing in the separation and divorce, but you're going to need somebody to help you figure out how to manage your financial affairs going forward. So chances are you're going to be working with a financial professional anyway. So let's get that, you know, let's find somebody for you now who you feel comfortable with, who will be able to help you in the future as well. So there are so many facets to the work that we do there. There's the legal aspect of it, the financial aspect, the children, the emotional stuff. There's a lot. There's a lot to it. There's a lot. Yeah, the work is amazing. The work is amazing for people who really want to do this in the best way possible for yeah. everyone involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Eliminate yeah. so much grieving. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And also, I think when they do it well, the, the you know the grief you know, and you probably both understand this more than anybody else. The person who like when somebody in your family dies, like a parent, for example, if you are not complete about your relationship with them and then they die, the grief is unbearable because you can't undo, go back, clean it up. But when you complete every step of the way, yes, you're upset and you're sad about the, that the fact that they're no longer here, but you don't have that, 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 it, it doesn't take your guts out. Right. The fear, because you know more now. You right. know better. You know a little more. And that's the key, especially with when it comes to the children. You know, to be clear and communicate and, and to know better. It's yeah. when nothing said and, oh, one day daddy's moving out. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. And you know what, too, Susan? The thing about that, too, is that this is life. 
you know, 50% of marriages end in divorce. So, you know, we have to stop pretending like there's something wrong here. This is just part of life. And how the parents behave as they go through it and normalize it as much as possible really teaches and demonstrates to their children that life keeps coming at you. Things change. It's things, you know, you have ex certain expectations. They may not be met, but you have to learn how to adjust and adapt to the changing circumstances and you can, you can do it. So they're, they're, demonstrating, I think, something really important for their children when they do it well. And mediation to me is 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 is, is the way to go. It Just those couple of sentences that can change the whole journey. It can change right. the whole from right. getting from step A to step B. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We need your contact information. So why don't you give everyone uh, how to contact you best? Okay. So my name is Ada Haslocker, A-D-A. -A. Last name is H-A-S-L-O-E-C-H-E-R. My company is Divorce and Family Mediation Center. My web address, and I'll give you the easy one, is www.dfmcli.com. And my email address is ada, A-D-A at dfmcli.com. And I'll give you my phone number. Please feel free to call me. I do offer a no-fee Zoom consultation for my clients to explain the mediation process to the two of them, let them know the work that we will be doing together, what we will be accomplishing, and what the end result will be. I want to give them an idea about how long it'll take and what the fees are. And I want to be sure to answer their questions so that they know exactly what to expect from my process. My phone number is 631-585-5210. And I thank both of you so much for this opportunity. This was just wonderful. I appreciate it. We thank you. You do thank amazing you. work, Ada. You really do. Your whole genuine, this is this is definitely you. I mean, as a career person, this is definitely <laughs> you have shined through your love and your passion for something that you really believe in. And that's what we all want. Somebody like you, who we can trust and thank who we know really cares. So yeah. important. We yeah, thank you thank for the you. incredible work you did. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you so much for being here today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Susan, we will see each other again soon. Next week. Yep, next week. Thank you Sounds again, good. Ada. Thank we you. We wish you the best. Thank you. And you too. Thank you. Bye.